Good afternoon again. I'm glad to be here. I get to come about once a month. Um, didn't get to come in May. Uh, Devin and I switched. And uh, we, uh, Devin is Brienne and Hannah are in Korea looking at uh, how ministry is taking place there. And uh, we prayed for them. And we are continuing to pray for them. They're a true blessing to our church. So here I am uh, preaching the book of Ezra again, which will continue throughout the year. And uh, maybe around Christmas I, I may switch. But uh, for now, this is where God has us. Just a quick reminder. Um, Ezra started out in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 29, actually, where you know, it started a little bit before that, but we started in chapter 29 when God said, you guys are the children of Israel, you are not obeying me, I'm going to allow the Assyrians and others to come in here and uh, the Babylonians to come in here and take you, destroy the city, take you captive, and bring you back to Babylon. Uh, on a 1,600 kilometer trek. And uh, you will be there for 70 years. And <clears throat> then at the end of 70 years, when you've learned your lesson, I will set you free to come back to your home. And that's what happened. We went through chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Now we're in chapter 4, and we'll just get going with that. We have... Uh, if you have a device to follow along in Scripture, you can, or you can follow along in your in a regular Bible. You'll be flipping around a lot, or you can just follow up here. I have most of the Scriptures up here. So there's a lot of interesting content in uh, the chap chapter 4 of Ezra. There are certainly some portions of Scripture throughout the Bible that you know, we find, as I find, more difficult to follow than others. The first few chapters of the book of Ezra are a very good example of a passage for me that when I first read it and when I read it again to preach, uh, I thought, man, this is a little more difficult than I expected. It was quite a challenge for me personally to follow. Chapter 1 starts with a clear narrative kind of detailing a time that's easy to place in the story of Israel. And by the end of chapter 1, it turns into a, or chapter, yeah, chapter 1, it turns into a list of gold and silver articles that none of us, you know, pay much attention to. They were uh, returned to God's people from the Babylonians when they uh, captured the people of Israel. They took all the temple, the golden articles from the temple, most of them and took them back to Babylon, and then they were returned. Then we get into chapter 2. If you remember, it was just a long list, and I was wondering, and you were wondering, how in the world is Pastor Kevin going to preach from that? The majority of the chapter is spent listing all the people and their families that traveled to Jerusalem when King Cyrus, keep that name in mind, sent them back and sent back their animals and a lot of other animals with them because of the sacrificial system and also... From Babylon to Israel, it's a four-month trek, and they need to eat. So they brought lots of animals with them. And finally, in chapters 3 and 4, last time I was here in April, we talked about chapter 3. Today we're going to look at chapter 4. We get back to the action uh, as the rebuilding of the temple and the city and the walls uh, begins to take place. And then... Opposition awaits the people of God. And today's uh, title, as you could see in the bulletin, is about opposition. God's people will face uh, opposition. At first glance, it looks like a fairly straightforward story. But as we'll find out, um, it's not that simple. But, but it's good stuff. God's word is so good and so honest. But before we read from chapter 4, let me remind you about how chapter 3 ended. It was very interesting and very moving. Um, let, let me just read. If you want to follow along, I don't have it up here. Um, I'll just read it, the, a couple of verses from the end of chapter 3. This is what happened toward the end. 
They sang with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love to Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. This is a temple. The foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and family heads who had seen the first temple, the temple that Solomon built, wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this temple. But many others shouted joyfully. And we discussed why, why the younger people were shouting joyfully, why the younger ones or older ones were crying. Uh, maybe this one is nothing compared to the temple of Solomon or... We're crying because finally it got built. We don't, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. So you're left to, to think. Everything at this point in the, the narrative we're reading today seems to be going well. God has stirred their hearts to leave a land they had grown quite comfortable with. They were living their lives. They had families. They had jobs, probably. Uh, they were uh, accustomed to the way the Babylonians were doing. And God had told them, live with them. Be good neighbors. And they had done it. And then God said, through the king there, it's time to go back. And several of them decided, we're going back. Maybe up to 40, 50,000 people decided to go back. And God had protected them on, a, on this 1,600-kilometer journey, four months and plus. And when they arrived, they had made worshiping God their first priority. They didn't put it to the side. We'll get to that later. Let's build some houses. Let's build some walls. They didn't do that. They had become deeply committed to following the Lord. They were faithful, obedient, and their unity was very pleasing to God. The chapter says they became as one man. They were so unified to serve God. Why we might say they were on a spiritual high. There was excitement about the things of God. We've all been there, right? There was excitement about the altar. I mean, the sacrificial system. I have been in churches in America, and the altar was a big deal. After church, I mean, people came up to the altar, and there was no place to walk. People were down on their knees, down on their face, seeking God. People were being prayed for. And the whole elders of the church came forward, and they prayed. There was altar excitement. That's, that's just the word I came up with, but that's what I think was happening. The festivals had been reestablished. They were doing Passover, the Feast of Booze. They were just enjoying God. There was a stunning closeness to God. And you know, I don't have to tell you, it's during these spiritual highs that the enemy, the evil one, the enemy of God's people chooses to attack, doesn't he? Everything seemed to be going so good when they got a visit from their neighbors. Oh, be careful when you get a visit from your neighbors. You never know. Now let's take a look at the text. Okay. Let me read how the story begins today. When the enemies of Judah, notice what they're called here, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel's their social leader, basically, and the family heads, and said to them, let us build with you, where we also worship your God, and have been sacrificing to him since the time King Asar Hadan of Assyria brought us here. And we can find this in the Old Testament, where they were brought here by the king of Assyria. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, or Joshua, and the other heads of Israel's families answered them, You may have no part with us in building a house for our God, since we alone will build it. 
for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Wow, kind of harsh, huh? Well, we read that some neighboring peoples, so when, they, when the people of Israel moved back into the area of Jerusalem and were beginning to settle down and build the house of God, they got some offers of help. So these people, probably the people group that show up in the New Testament, we know them as the Samaritans. Jesus talked to a Samaritan woman. Jesus took on the, the name of the Good Samaritan. They probably heard about the temple rebuild project, and they came to offer help. At first, to some, maybe some of you, some who are reading this, might think, Oh, sounds like a good idea. You probably need some help building this. There might be some experts in the crowd, some stonemasons, some uh, carpenters. Some people are good with animals. Why not befriend our new neighbors? You've heard the expression that if it's something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah, this may have been the case here. Their offer was probably, probably not fully genuine. The author here, and I think it's Ezra, calls them the enemies in verse 1, right? The enemies of Judah and Benjamin. But there are other scholars who think this group of people were perhaps just naive about how the Jews thought about their uh, cleanliness and their worship to God. For example, their enemies might have just thought they could sacrifice to the God of Israel, just as the way they were sacrificing to their other gods, right? They sacrificed to different kinds of gods. The God of Israel, just another one. We'll sacrifice two along with you. Well, of course, to the Jew, that was just impossible, right? Impossible, and they would have no part of that. So the idea that they were offering to help might be that they were doing so just to infiltrate the workspace of God's people and begin to cause trouble. That's probably a valid assumption, or more than an assumption. The knowledge might fit. It wouldn't be hard to do that from the inside, right? If you wanted to sabotage a project, it's better to do it from the inside than the outside. Why not just join them and uh, you know, maybe give a little strange food to the animals, or maybe hide some tools? or maybe give some incorrect measurements, and so on. There could be many things. They, the work could be intentionally slowed down. But there's one more thing to consider about this group coming in and working with the Jews, with the children of Israel. These outsiders might really have wanted to help, but they were idol worshipers. And as such, they were a great danger to the people of Israel. Mixing with idol worshipers had never gone well for the children of Israel. And it's quite likely that the leaders of Israel were given discernment by God to realize this danger. And he said, whoa. Just tell them thank you, but no thank you, in certain terms. It was extremely important, important then <clears throat> for the leaders of the church to have godly discernment, and it's still important today. So Zerubbabel and Joshua and the people were therefore, I think, justified in being a little rude, maybe, in their exclusivity. They kept it to, to an exclusive club. We're going to do this. We've been assigned to do this. The king told us to do this. God wants us to do this for him. We are his people. We'll do this. Thank you, but no thank you. And they refused the help. In verse 3, it says, You have no part with us in building a house for our God, since we alone will build it for the Lord, <clears throat> the God of Israel. As King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Now, 
Well, I'll just, we'll just go to the next slide. I want to say something else, but. Excuse me. <clears throat> then the people, let's go on to verses 4 and 5, and then verse 24. Then the people who were already in the land, now these are the, the enemies who just said, hey, can we help you? And then these people came along, and you know, this is their, neck, their response to being shut out. Then the people who were already in the land discouraged <clears throat> the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. They also bribed officials to act against them to frustrate their plans throughout the reign of King Cyrus of Persia and until the reign of King Darius of Persia. Now the construction of God's house in Jerusalem had stopped and remained at a standstill until the second year of the king of King Darius of Persia. Wow, a lot went on here. Verse 4 lets us know that these enemies did not appreciate this denial of service, oh, you, we wanted to help them, but they wouldn't let us help us? Okay, we'll pay them back. And from that point, the people who are already in the land, the scripture says, discourage the people of Judah. They made them afraid. It looks like their true colors came out, huh? But it's in verse 5 that things start to get really interesting at least to, in regards to what we're going to talk about today. Look at verse 5. They, on the set there, do I have that? No. Yeah, that's right. Okay. They also bribed officials to act against them, to frustrate their plans. They weren't satisfied with just not working with them. They wanted to really cause some problems. They did it throughout the reign of King Cyrus. So when these enemies tried and failed to infiltrate the work of the people of God, they decided, let's take another route. Let's try bribery. Let's try fear tactics. And so if we think about our lives today as a Christian, has the enemy of God's people changed his tactics at all? What does he do to us to slow down what we're doing for the Lord? Does he discourage you? Does he sometimes cause you to be afraid? Oh, man, God's not answering my prayer. What's going on? Getting a little worried. Do you get frustrated trying to do things for God? Mm, I think so. I don't think the devil has changed his plan. His, he has a plan to get close to us and to sabotage the work of God in our life. And when that doesn't work, he'll be there to discourage you, to cause you to fear, and to be really frustrated with this Christian life. My Christian friends told me if I got saved, everything would be good, smooth. I'd be happy. Doesn't work that way all the time, does it? And as we'll see, the attacks from the enemy of God's people in this story in Ezra were relentless. They just came time and time and time again, day after day, month after month, year after year. You probably noticed that I skipped all the way down to verse 24 after verse 5. That needs a little explanation, I think. So we have this chart up here. I don't usually like these kinds of things, but just needs, it can help a little bit with what we're looking at today. So verse 6, if you can read it on your own, not, maybe not while I'm preaching, but that would be okay too. But read it on your own. You'll find out it starts talking about the reign of King Xerxes, not Cyrus, which is in the top of the chart. And verse 7 starts to uh, points out King Ataxerxes. It's at this point with several kings named, in as many verses, just, you know, seven verses, that gets complicated. Who are these guys? Why is, why is this inserted right in the middle of this, this chapter? Well, reasonable questions. We won't take time to read all these verses, verses 6 through 23. They, but one thing to see, they detail one of the most clever schemes against God's people in all of the Bible, I think. 
The enemies of God use the king's ego. He's way back in, in Babylon, but it's, it's called, uh, it's not called Babylon anymore. It's uh, basically I, I, Iran, that area. But they use his ego and his pride and his fears to convince him to put a stop to the building of the wall, not the house of God, the wall around Jerusalem. And then we go all the way down to verse 23. It tells us that, his enemy, that the enemies of the people of God at the king's command forcefully stopped the Jews from building. Then verse 24 says, the construction of God's house, which we read, verse 24, in Jerusalem and had stopped... And the author makes a very strong statement here. It didn't just stop, but it remained at a standstill. And he gives how long? Until the second reign, the second year of the reign of King Darius of Persia. You don't have to figure it out. I'll tell you. 16 years, at least 16 years. So the letter that gets sent to Artaxerxes describes the people of Jerusalem rebuilding the walls and the foundations in verse 12. But back at the beginning, the text that we're reading today, we're talking about today, when the opposition first arrived, it's talking about the rebuilding of the temple. So that's what we're talking about, the temple. Not the walls, not the city, the temple. So if you're reading from a study Bible or you, you might, your software might have some notes at the bottom, the footnotes probably explain all of this you see up here. But it's kind of a rough timeline, but there's some points to all of this. So Cyrus was the king who released the people from uh, their exile and allowed or commanded them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. We have, you can see up there a guy named Cambyses. Uh, he's not mentioned in the Bible, probably because he didn't do anything noteworthy during his reign. So Cambyses is the next king. He's not mentioned, didn't do anything significant. Um, the next king is referred to as Darius. We read in Ezra 4, 5 that the enemies worked against the builders uh, during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. There we go. And next we have Xerxes, uh, continued opposition. We only have one verse. Verse 6 talks about they sent a letter to Xerxes, and then... And verses 7 through 23 has to do with uh, letters sent to Artaxerxes and his responses to them. So the historical record uh, confirms, though, history says that in uh, 516 or 516, uh, 15 BC, somewhere around there, um, and then in Ezra chapter 6, verse 15 says that uh, in the temple was completed, the rebuilt temple was it was done, finished in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So there we go. So what's going on here? Why, why in the middle of these verses is it talking about the house of God, the, the temple being built, and then suddenly the writer of this book, Ezra, inserts this? Because in chapter 4, Ezra's not confused, the most common and logical solution and uh, explanation from Bible, biblical scholars and historians say that, you know, Ezra is telling us there's opposition from, chap from verse 1 and, you know, opposition to the building of the temple. And then in verse 6 and 7 and on through 22, it continued year after year after year, king after king after king, that the Jews were being opposed in whatever they did for the Lord. So it's a, a parenthetical statement, a literary digression, some scholars call it, an aside included to add emphasis and draw attention to the theme of opposition all through the work of the people of God in Ezra and actually throughout the whole Bible. And I found a, a pastor named Andrew who uh, wrote a small paraphrase so that um, his Bible study group or his church, you know, his group of believers, could, could pick up on what happened here. So let me read, let me borrow from Andrew. After denying help from the locals, 
the enemies to rebuild the temple, the people of God faced constant opposition. They faced opposition for years, all the way until the reign of King Darius. In fact, the opposition didn't even fully stop there. An accusation was lodged during the next king, Xerxes. And even years later, when Ataxerxes was on the throne, the enemies devised a letter and a scheme preying on his fear to convince him to put a stop to the people who had long since finished the temple and were now rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. But anyway, back to the start of the process, there was so much opposition that the temple building was basically at a standstill until the second year of Darius. That ends at verse 24, at verse 23. And then in verse 24, we're given the picture, it stopped. They just stopped building. So the plots of the enemies, you know, just went on and on and on for decades, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the foundation, rebuilding the walls. Ezra doesn't want this point missed. The task was not easy for God's people, and the opposition was continuous. And yet, brothers and sisters, we know from continuing to read Ezra and, the, and Nehemiah later that the job was completed. By the strength and grace of God, the people accomplished the task that God had set before them. Because God was faithful through all the opposition. Is this true for us today? Yes, both statements are true. You and I, as we walk with God as his children, will be opposed by the enemies of God. And yes, at the same time, God will be faithful to us too in the midst of all. Paul the Apostle had his share of opposition, much more than any Christian I think we can list. Let's take a quick look at something Paul wrote about opposition in the book of Romans. Switching from the Old Testament to the New, Romans chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. It's good until that point, right? Oh, so we hope we can boast in the glory of God. Praise God. God is filled with glory. And then Paul goes on. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions. Oh, my. Hmm. Paul, are you okay? Because we know that affliction produces endurance. Okay. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Is Paul actually saying that hard times actually strengthen the believer? I think he is. I'm not going to say that I like the process very much, but that's what Paul is saying. Hope does not disappoint us. Get back to the story of Ezra. Remember, the building of the temple had stopped cold for 16 years by legal injunction of the king. And this injunction was sought through many lies. They were stretching the truth when they wrote to the king. and said, this is what they're doing. This is what they're going to do. They've been this way. They're always going to be this way. It wasn't very encouraging. Not very encouraging to read today. 16 years is a long time. But remember this, God's word is very honest. 
He says it like it happened. Paul speaks in his letters of both open doors for the people of God, and he speaks of a time when doors seem closed permanently. And Paul also tells us that's when the believers must stand on God's word in spite of the struggle, in spite of the opposition. The people of God in Ezra's day threw their hands up. <laughs> That's enough for me. They threw their hands up and did little to nothing to serve God for 16 years. They were so disappointed, so afraid, and so discouraged. And then God moved in their lives and sent them his word. But when the pro Ezra chapter 5, but when the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah, in Jerusalem, in the name of God of Israel, who was over them, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jezadak, uh, jo Jozadak, began to rebuild God's house in Jerusalem. The prophets of God were with them, helping them. After 16 long years of desperation, God spoke to his people, and they gladly listened. Look at what these verses say. God was over the people. In the beginning, when they came over there, they were obedient. They were listening to God. They had reinstituted sacrifices. They were worshiping. They were singing. They were joyful. They were weeping with joy. But then for 16 years, it was just, eh, ah, where's God? Where's his word? Why didn't he answer our prayers? I'm not even going to pray anymore. I don't know. But God was over the people, and the prophets began to teach the word of God to them. And then the prophets actually joined in helping them with the building process. That's pretty nice. And let's look in Haggai a little closer at what the prophets actually said. Or you can just read it here if I remember to switch. <laughs> okay, I switched. So let's go to Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. By the way, this is, he's a contemporary. This is a prophet who prophesied when this was all going on right at the time. So in the second year of King Darius, same date, right? In the second year of King Darius, we read that in Ezra. On the first day of the sixth month, so for 16 long years, we're going to have this, you know, this wait. And then for 24 days, something is really, really good is going to happen. So hang in there. Once, once again, in the second year of King Darius, on the second day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel. We've, we just read about them. The governor of Judah and to Joshua, Jeshua, uh, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The Lord of armies says this, these people say the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be re rebuilt. What's wrong with these guys? They're disappointed. They're discouraged. They're afraid. They're frustrated. And God raised up these prophets to speak his word into their lives. The people weren't too afraid, though, if we read carefully, they were building their homes. They were paneling their homes, the Bible says very clearly. They weren't too afraid to be doing that, but they, were ne ne they weren't neglecting their own homes, but they were neglecting the house of God. Basically, they had given up, yet God loved his people too much to let them stay discouraged and to let them neglect the house of God, which they needed. They needed the house of God in their lives. Pastor Hiroshi's message this morning talks about the church and being in the church, being in the body. Let's take a look at the. We'll go quickly through these verses. 
Let the word of God speak to you through this. And then verses, uh, chapter 1 of Haggai, verses 7 and 8, and then verse 12. The Lord of armies says this. He's talking to the, now they're, they're speaking directly to the people of God now. Think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber, and build the house. And I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared and respected, and both meanings are there, the Lord. Look at this very carefully. Think carefully about how you are living, people. Go and do what you should have been doing all along. You know you should have been doing this. Go. I had to send you these prophets to remind you. Now go. And when you go, I will be pleased and I will be glorified. Just do what I asked you to do to begin with. Nothing new. And they responded to his call by honoring him, by fearing him. They took off. They went to the mountains. And they did what God told them to do. Then Haggai, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, continuing in Haggai. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. I am with you. I am with you. Have you heard that before? Have you heard that preached before in this church? I am with you. And he says, this is the Lord's declaration. The Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel. He roused the spirit. Remember in the beginning, he roused the spirit of King Cyrus. He roused the spirit of Zerubbabel years and years ago to, to get up from Babylon and come back to Jerusalem. He's doing it again. The Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the son of the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. They began to work on the house of the Lord of armies, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. We've seen that time and time again. So it took 24 days, 16 years of drought, spiritual drought. And God comes in and puts his word into God's people. And he says, this key thing, I think to me, is I am with you. Just do it. Go for it. I am with you. Remember Emmanuel, right? I am with you. And the only victory of the enemies of God's people was to delay the work of God, but never to defeat it. Amen? They delayed it, but they didn't defeat it. As I've said throughout today's teaching, is that you and I, as Christians, will face, we will face many challenges from our enemy as we walk with him, as we attempt to do works for him. Now, brothers and sisters, I know you've read it, and I know you've heard it. In 1 Peter, Peter tells us, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you, as if something unusual was happening to you. Now, it's not on the screen, so I didn't put it up on the screen, but if you want to know the reference, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. We shouldn't be surprised when the enemy comes against us. Wow, I thought, I thought being Christian was smooth, <laughs> easy. Be happy and healthy all the time. That's what I see on some of these channels. We shouldn't be surprised. But we should know our enemy. And we should be ready when this happens. We can be ready. Remember, Paul had these experiences over and over and over again, maybe more than any other. Let's see what Paul says to the church at Ephesus. Find 
Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against what? Not the schemes of your neighbors, not those enemies who came to Ezra's people and said, hey, let us help you build that. No. Oh. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. And then he goes on to clarify. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic cosmic powers of this darkness against evil, spiritual forces in the heavens. Put on God's armor, which you can continue reading in verses 13 through 18 of Ephesians 6. Church, we need to know our enemy and we need to be ready. The lessons that we learn from Ezra, nothing new. Therefore, those days and they're for us today. So we need to study the whole Bible. Let's continue to study the whole Bible. God is teaching us through this. So how did Paul conclude this, you know, this, after giving these severe warnings? Look at what Paul says. If you, it's not on the screen, but let me read it to you. Verses 23 and 24, after all this. Now, ah, devil's coming. Get ready. This is what Paul says. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have undying love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth to teach us the truth about who the Father is, about who the Son is, and to go to the cross, to die in our place, to show us what true peace, true love, true grace is. And he died on that cross. It's all about grace and love and peace from God, our Father. We will face our enemy. We will be confronted. There will be hard times. But we can have the peace of God because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the book of Ezra, for your word in its entirety. Thank you for teaching us. Lord, we pray that your word will find deep root in our hearts today. We know we have to be aware that as we live for you, we will always be opposed. The opposition comes from uh, the enemy who will never stop as long as we're living for you. Lord, we ask that we do not go forward in our own strength, but we go forward in the power of the Holy Spirit that you've sent to live in us. Thank you, Lord. We we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, please stand. <laughs>